Confirmed as the costliest battle in U.S. history, the Three-Day Battle of Gettysburg is now remembered as the turning point during the American Civil War. With an estimated 50,000 casualties across both Union and Confederate lines, it is remarkable that the war would continue on for another two years. Yet, on July 4, 1863, one Union general had the opportunity to pursue Robert E. Lee's Confederate Cavalry Brigade as they retreated towards the Potomac River. If executed swiftly, this single tactical decision could have ended the Civil War entirely. However, the Union general chose not to pursue Lee's cavalry, despite direct orders from the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. How did Lincoln respond to this inaction? And what can we learn from this story? Today on Hindsight History, we discuss the defining moment that occurred early in Lincoln's life, which would shape the man later on into his refined years to have the emotional intelligence to control impulsive emotions. In the summer of 1842, a young Abraham Lincoln was growing his law practice in Springfield, Illinois, where he also supported the political party known as the Whigs. During this time, beginning with the Panic of 1837, the United States was suffering a great financial depression under Presidents Andrew Jackson and later Martin Van Buren. With stagnant wage growth, inflated prices, and unemployment at a record high, a majority of people did not trust the banks, let alone the government. No unified American currency existed during this time. Rather, individual banks printed their own banknotes, which was backed by silver and gold coins. By 1842, the State Bank of Illinois was on the brink of bankruptcy. It didn't take long before families lost their entire life savings. Tasked to solve the crisis was put into the hands of James Shields, an Irish immigrant who had been a soldier in the Black Hawk War as well as a Springfield lawyer, similar to Lincoln. During the crisis, Shields held the position of Illinois State Auditor, where he was responsible for managing the state's budget, all while remaining fervently loyal to the Democratic Party. Shields, along with the Illinois State Governor and Treasurer, signed a proclamation ordering individuals to pay their taxes with silver or gold rather than banknotes. Lincoln examined the proclamation and realized this would surely cripple lower-income individuals more than ever. The Whig Party viewed this proclamation as a selfish order to protect state officials' own salaries rather than the welfare of the common people. Lincoln decided to act. In the 19th century, politicians frequently resorted to mudslinging where they attacked the character of other candidates, often through anonymous letters signed under a fake name. On September 2, 1842, Lincoln wrote a letter to the editor of the Sangamo Journal, a local Whig newspaper, where he spoke negatively about the state's proclamation and most of all, referred to James Shields as a fool, liar, and a conceited dunce. Lincoln signed the letter from a fabricated character named Aunt Rebecca from a made-up place known as the Lost Townships. The next day, the entire town of Springfield read Aunt Rebecca's letter in the Sangamo Journal. Shields became irate and sent a colleague to the journal's editor's office to discover who wrote the Aunt Rebecca letter. As soon as Lincoln heard about the demand, he told the editor to give the name Abraham Lincoln. Shields stated that Lincoln had damaged his integrity and reputation throughout the community. As a result, Shields challenged Lincoln to a duel. As the challenged individual, Lincoln had the authority to decide the rules of the engagement. It was common practice that most duels were fought with pistols, but being six feet four inches, Lincoln chose an alternate method, cavalry broadswords of the largest size. For position, a plank 10 feet long and from 9 to 12 inches broad, it is no secret that only a man with incredibly long reach could effectively reach their opponent from that distance. Not to mention, Lincoln had seven inches on Shields' five foot nine frame. The duel would take place on September 22, 1842 at Bloody Island, a densely wooded rendezvous point for duelists located on a sandbar within the Mississippi River. Local citizens gathered around the banks to watch the two men step forward. 
Shields tested his broad sword by slashing through the open air, while his second begged for him to call off the duel. Shields declined. At the opposite side of the plank, Lincoln raised his sword high overhead and sliced a large branch from a tree in hopes to intimidate his opponent. As they approached one another, a roaring call was signaled telling the men to stop. At this point, the seconds for both men jumped between them and called for a delay. Lincoln's second informed him that Shields had withdrawn his accusation. Lincoln, not realizing that this was a lie, reconsidered the gentleman's code of dueling. With this abrupt news, Lincoln went on to explain what he did and why. With this revelation, James Shields accepted Lincoln's apology. The broadswords were sheathed and the two men shook hands. From this moment on, Lincoln vowed to never again write a hurtful word or speak ill of anyone, a promise that would surely test him years later in one of the greatest conflicts in history. As for James Shields, he would lead an impressive political and military career following the duel. Two decades later, the Civil War would reunite the two men. Shields was nominated for the rank of Brigadier General in the Union Army. Final approval fell to the President, Abraham Lincoln. He approved the nomination. Lincoln never spoke about the duel. In fact, while serving later as President, an Army officer asked Lincoln if the stories of the duel were indeed true. Lincoln replied, I do not deny it, but if you desire my friendship, you will never mention it again. Twenty-one years following the duel, at the height of the American Civil War, General Robert E. Lee's Southern Confederate troops were determined to take the offensive and invade the Northern Territory to eventually capture Washington. Both sides would meet at a small Pennsylvania village known famously today as Gettysburg, where they would fight the most famous battle in the history of the United States. During the first two days of the fighting, the Union Army lost 20,000 men. Lee was eager to wipe out the remaining Union forces by an assault tactic out in the open led by General George Pickett. This attack, known as Pickett's Charge, became Lee's Achilles heel. George Pickett led his southern troops in the most catastrophic charge ever known throughout the western world. Tragically, the men were led to their demise. In a few short minutes, Pickett's entire brigade commanders except for one were killed and four-fifths of his 5,000 men had fallen. Lee's bold move had not succeeded. The Confederate Army would not be able to conquer the North. In the late hours of July 4, 1863, Lee with his remaining men started their retreat from Gettysburg. A thick rain began to fall, and as a result, by the time they reached the Potomac River, the water became so immense that they were unable to cross effectively. Lee and his southern troops suddenly became exposed. With an obstructed river in front of them, this would surely lead to a Confederate downfall. Leading the Union victory at Gettysburg was George Meade, a narcissistic character with a long military career. Once the news was related to President Lincoln, he was ecstatic. But the history books would not write of a Union victory in 1863. For an entire week, Lincoln again and again urged Meade to attack, but Meade did nothing. He stalled with caution, he backed down from the order, and telegraphed excuses. All the while, the waters dwindled, and Lee and his men escaped. Lincoln became enraged. At the White House, Lincoln is quoted as saying, we had them within our grasp and had only to stretch forth our hands and they were ours. Similarly to what he had done in the summer of 1842 with the Rebecca letter, Lincoln sat down and wrote another letter to General Meade. In frustration, Lincoln put his pen to paper and wrote, My dear General, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our grasp, and to have closed upon him would have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged 
indefinitely. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably by it. Lincoln reread his letter and thought about the situation at hand. Historians have theorized that he most likely came to the conclusion that this letter would have personally hurt the general. So he put it aside. The letter was never seen again until the 20th century when the former president's documents were reopened. Underneath the letter to General Meade was a notation stating never sent and never signed. Lincoln learned his lesson from the 1842 almost duel. He displayed sympathy rather than criticism. As the Civil War continued, General Meade was not without his trials. Due to his more cautious military approach following the Battle of Gettysburg, Meade's authority was superseded by the appointment of Ulysses S. Grant as General in Chief of the Union Armies. During the attack on General Lee's troops in Petersburg, Virginia, Meade again failed to attack before they could reinforce the line, resulting in a 10-month stalemate. Should Lincoln have indeed sent this letter to prevent Meade's further lapses of judgment? Or is it always best to pause on our letters, emails, and text messages before accusing another person? Leave your comments below. As always, thank you so much for watching this story on Lincoln. Look forward to more historical insight very soon. And if you like this, you can click right here for more content from Hindsight History.